looking around the room, I see young faces and not so young faces. I don't see anyone old here. No, no old person in this room because Marxism keeps us young. But uh, as some of the not so young comrades will, will remember, Ted was always young. Ted Grant. And never admitted to being older than 21. Always 21 years of age until a few years before he died when we suddenly discovered the awful truth. He admitted to being 22. But Ted was always young in spirit. And the reason I say this, it seems to me personally, it seems impossible to imagine that Ted was born a hundred years ago. It seems impossible to imagine that he's not with us now because he seemed like a permanent fixture. Comments are in this room, the veteran comments, will we'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, but Ted Grant was, was an, an important figure. You know, when I started to write this book, an important political figure, that is. When I started to write the book, suddenly comments were sending me all kinds of anecdotes. Well, if we were to talk about the anecdotes of Ted Grant, we could write several volumes. But that, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't do justice to Ted Grant as a political figure, because he was a political figure. Ted Grant, for anyone who knows it, he was his ideas. If ever there was a person you could say this of, that the ideas were the man, and the man was the ideas, and that person was Ted Grant. There's no question. And therefore, with your permission, I will deal with the, the main events in this life, but also with some of the ideas which he put forward, because Ted Grant had the great honor of being that man who preserved the genuine essence of Marxism, or if you like Trotskyism, I use the two terms interchangeably. He not only preserved Trotskyism, and I, I, I would maintain that he was the only person who so to do, he actually was the only one that developed Marxism and introduced, in my opinion, new ideas, very important ideas, key ideas for understanding the events of the period in which we live. Now, this morning was the first of May. I didn't go because I, I was rather busy. But uh, as, as you know, the, the, the first of May in London is not the world's most exciting event. I think if it wasn't for the Turkish Congress, there would be no first of May. And selling papers, well, of course, I think there's sometimes, I sometimes think there's more, more groups selling papers to each other than there are people on the demonstration. And one thing that strikes me about these different left groups, I don't wish to speak distress, dis disrespectfully about anybody, but one, one thing that strikes me, when you read their newspapers and the documents, most, if not all of them, really believe that history begins with them, with their little group and their own little original doctrine, whatever that might be. Well, you know, our tendency is not like that. We understand, or ought to understand, history does not begin with us. And insofar as we can be said to be doing great things, it is because we stand on the shoulders of giants, of Marx, of Engels, of Lenin, of Trotsky, of Rosa Luxemburg, of James Connolly, and yes, why not add I think it's only justice to add the name of Ted Grant, who was a giant. <clears throat> don't, take my, don't take my word for it, by the way. When Ted Grant died, there were obituaries, long obituaries, about him in all the main bourgeois papers, the Times, the Financial Times, the Economist. Here was a man that succeeded in making a notable difference to the British political scene, to the scene on the left. Not many people can say that. I don't think many of the founders in the other groups will enjoy such fame as that. It was a deserved fame, not only because of his colossal political contribution, it was colossal, it remains colossal, but the man actually achieved something which no other group claiming to be Trotskyists could possibly claim. Ted Grant was the founder of militant, to be, be under no illusions on this subject. Uh, certain other people might have some claim, but uh, it's false. Ted Grant was the founder of the militant in, in every sense, but above all, it was the ideas of Ted. It was the theories of Ted. It was the perspectives and the method that he, that he taught us all. 
that enabled us to achieve what no other group has done, to build in effect the biggest and the most influential and the most important Trotskyist organization in history since the Russian left opposition. That's a fact. Which even our enemies will have to maintain. Ted Grant, a few years ago. Okay, come in. Come in. Welcome. Thank you. A few years ago, well, I say a few, I say a few years ago, it's about 25 years ago, I think, when, when we produced the first volume of Ted Grant's writings, the title that was chosen was The Unbroken Thread. Now that is an important title. Ted was always insisted on the, on the importance of history, not just in a general sense, but our history. It's very important, and I address myself to the young comments here, it's very important that you understand who we are and where we have come from. That's a big subject. But the unbroken thread, really, if you're looking for a phrase that will sum up Ted Grant, well, that is it, the unbroken thread. Ted actually told me when I was uh, quite young, he told me that before the, the Second World War, there was an old comrade in our organization that had been a member of the first, the second, the third, and the fourth internationals. Now I never met this gentleman, he's too, too young. But certainly what I can say to you is this. Through the person of Ted Grant, you can certainly trace his history, we'll deal with that in a moment. You can, deal, you can directly trace our history back to the early days of the left opposition and of Trotsky and Trotskyism. Through Ted Grant, I mean, we, we, we can trace our history back to, 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 to left opposition, to the Russian Revolution, to the Bolshevik Party, and yes, to the Communist Manifesto. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, isn't the, they ask me, I was in Greece, this is a paper of series of RTE. I got a full page uh, interview with that, you see, the translations in uh, Marxist.com. But they always ask the same question, why do you think that Marxism is, is Marxism still relevant? Well, good heavens above. The whole march of history demonstrates the correctness of Marxism. The entire situation in the world demonstrates the correctness, the correctness of Marxism. The situation in Greece, which is desperate, there's a general strike again today, that makes the 22nd one-day general strike in the last four years, plus three 48-hour general strikes. And they say that the working class is not moving, which is entirely false. And the, the correctness of Marxism, which Ted always defended when, when, when other people were abandoning Marxism, but don't forget that. Ted stood firm on this, on this uh, issue. Now, Ted was born, I first met Ted, by the way, in 1960, when I was six, 16 years of age, I joined the Young Sources. I was, a star, I was a Stalinist at the time, not your milk and water, Euro, Euro communist stuff, I was the genuine idol. I come from a working class communist family in South Wales. It, it was a bit of a hard struggle, but within a few months it convinced me of the errors of my ways, although I never convinced my grandfather, unfortunately. But Tell and I worked together, what, what uh, Julian said is correct. We worked closely together for almost half a century. And I got to know the, know the man perhaps better than most. Now, Ted was born on the 9th of July, my memory doesn't escape me, in the town of Germiston, it's quite an important town, mining town actually, near Johannesburg in South Africa, to a, a relatively well-off Jewish middle-class family. He told me, I asked him, when did you first get in, how did you come involved in politics? He said, it's been, it's, I became involved in politics because of the blacks, because of the, the, the way that the black workers and the black servants were treated. And by the way, I'll say this to you, that um, sometimes you come across people, well-meaning, perfectly decent comrades, who are Marxists, genuinely, they believe that they're Marxists, but their Marxism is somewhat superficial. It's an idea, it's an abstract idea. That wasn't the case with Ted Grant. It was a deeply rooted, Ted had a deeply, from his, from his youngest days, he had a deeply rooted hatred of all kinds of injustice, to, it penetrated, I think, to the marrow of his bones. He became, and he joined the Communist Party in, in South Africa. Imagine that, in, when he was 14 years of age. He told me that he started to read Capital, Marxist Capital, when he was 14. I might add that I also started to read Marxist Capital when I was 14. I went to the 
in Swansea Public Library and took out the book. I read the first hundred pages and I came to the following conclusion. That nobody could ever understand this book. <laughs> I read it subsequently, it made more sense. When you're 14. Ted started to study Marxist theory and developed what I can only describe as a passion for theory. It wasn't just a kind of minor that too many people, and I'm afraid even in our own context very often, they treat theory as if it were kind of a kind of <clears throat> optional extra, as if it were the fairy on the Christmas tree. No such thing, comrades. Theory is the very foundation, the rock, of the Marxist movement. Without theory, Lenin said this, he said, without revolutionary theory, there cannot be a revolutionary party. How many people have understood that really? I sometimes ask myself. In fact, Ted, <coughs> towards the last years of his life, one day he said to me, <coughs> he said, Alan, I don't know why Lenin wrote so many books. He said, because nobody reads them anymore, and if they do read them, they don't understand a single word. How very true. But for Ted, theory was an absolute necessity. It was a, it was a passion which never lost him <coughs> from the first days to the last. And he became a, a theoretician of stature, whose ideas still have an effect. I will deal with that in a minute. It's not that Hugo Chavez, who I knew personally, as some of you probably, probably know, uh, how he contacted Hugo Chavez in the first instance was through the book, Reason in the Road which bowled him over. He was astonished and was really impressed with it, recommended it to people, and he was very interested in, in our ideas. <clears throat> That's the power of ideas, comrades. That's another point I wish to make to you. you know, too, many think, too many people on the left imagine that politics is this or politics is that. It's organizations and apparatus. It's even a little name. No, 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 no. Politics, the power of our tendency is the power of ideas. And there's no greater power in the world. Even Victor Hugo, I understood that, he wasn't a Marxist, but he said, no power on earth can stop an idea whose time has come. And I firmly believe, despite all the difficulties that we have faced, and all the problems and all the setbacks, that this epoch, of capitalist crisis is precisely a period in which the idea of Marxism has come into its own. No question about it. To go back to Ted's early development, I think on one occasion he rejected religion at a young age. He said he was in the school one time, some teacher was talking about, the, you know, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and this stuff. And he, he asked the question, yes, and who created God? Fair enough question, you think? No answer. <laughs> Developed a passion also for science, for philosophy, which is the strongest uh, point. But he wasn't just interested in ideas. That's also not correct. You know, Mike can't be a Marxist just as a theoretician. He was a very practical Marxist. He joined the South African Communist Party, and then he met a small group of communists, very courageous people, that had been expelled from the South African Communist Party for defending Trotsky. This is in the early 30s, about 1930, thereabouts. A group led by a man called Ralph Lee, a very remarkable man. Well, they were all remarkable. Just imagine being in South Africa under those conditions. They formed a small group, Bolshevik Leninist organization. <coughs> they made a turn, although they were from the middle class, they made a turn, a sharp turn towards the black world. And uh, there again, to go back to the, the roots of Ted's Marxism, he said, no, it's, it, the, what, it, what moved me to act was the, the plight of the blacks. He said, you can't imagine it, what it was like in those days. The blacks were collectively enslaved. You can't use any other expression. Collect the black people as a whole were, were collectively enslaved to, to the whites. Couldn't imagine. He said, even an old man would be described as a boy, as he said, by, by these Africana types. These communists were courageous to go into the black areas, into the townships and so on, into the mining areas, and they actually organized a union, a trade union for the laundry workers, particularly exploited there, and they led an important strike, which must have taken some guts, even for a white person to be seen in the company of a kafir, as they were called in those days, would be uh, unthinkable. And Ted, by the way, always retained, although he was 
he became the most English of all English phenomena. You could see he was a bit of an English eccentric, you know. He was a little bit eccentric, then, as did his person, which added to his charm. I think the others would, would agree with that. But he never quite lost it, the contact with South Africa or his interest or his burning desire to, to, to defend the South African workers. I remember in the 80s when Kosato was organizing big strikes. So Ted was over the moon about this. About this. So he never, he never quite, even, even he didn't quite lose his South African accent. There was always a slight tinge there at the time. Nevertheless, because the conditions in South Africa were so atrocious, so difficult, Commerce sat down and discussed, the young commerce in particular, how, how old would he have been? 60 or at the most, something like that. And they decided that the war was coming, it was clear the war was going to come. Trotsky had already written about it. Europe, of course, was in a state of turmoil. Europe was the center, of course, and Britain at that time was still at the, at the, the head of an empire to which South Africa belonged. They made a courageous decision to break with their family, just leave. That just walked out. He didn't even inform his mother because he was sorry for it because the poor, poor woman died in a box operation. He never saw it now after that. They took a decision to leave, break their roots, leave everything, get on the, the first available ship and go to you know, go to Britain and to participate in building the Fourth International, building the Trotsky's movement at the time. Quite a, a heroic step to take. On the way to Britain, they passed through France. They tried to see Trotsky. Trotsky at that time was being pushed from pillar to post. There's a famous expression, the, the planet without a visa. No so-called democratic government will provide him with a visa to live anywhere in an honorable uh, exile until finally the Mexican government, which is left wing, provided him with, with, with uh, asylum. But for a short time he was in France, where again he was persecuted by the fascists and the Stalinists to make his life impossible. And therefore it was impossible for them to meet him. He was in, living in the conditions of, of clandestinity in France. They did meet Trotsky's son, Leon Sedov, a very important person, who at that time was the visible head of what became the Fourth International. Uh, he was the, he was the, the editor of the bulletin of the left, of the bulletin of the opposition. Originally, he was in Berlin, but the rise of the fascist meant they had to flee to, to France, 1933-34. They met Leon Sedov, and Le, Le, Ted almost he said made a big, big impression on Ted that he was a very good comrade, good guy. He said, he asked him a question: What's the class nature? Have you, have you got workers in you in South Africa? Ted said yes. And of course, the setup was delighted. The problem was, and we have to call a spade a shovel, that what Trotsky was trying to do under conditions of Stalinist counter <coughs> which was a dreadful episode, if you can call it that, I don't think that there's a single movement in history, the only thing I can think of was the early Christians in the Roman Empire, so persecuted, so vilified, so hunted, so oppressed as the Trotskyists. Trotsky saw his family murdered one by one, his, his children, his relatives, his friends, his comrades, were hunted down, murdered mercilessly. One of those who were killed was precisely the set up shortly after Ted left France. He met his murderer, actually. He said, I met a man called Etienne, who was the star who was infiltrated the Trotskyist group, a man called Etienne. He said, I didn't like the look of this man. His instinct was correct. His, his name was not Etienne, it was Zubrovsky. He was a KGB agent and he organized the murder of both Ignis Rice, who was an officer, imagine that, he was an officer in the, in the GPU that broke with Stalin and joined the, the Fourth International. He was murdered in Switzerland, 1937. Uh, Clement and other people were murdered. And of course, uh, Leon Sedler was also a victim. Ted, of course, came to London. By the way, on the, in the course of this journey, they decided he and another comrade, there were two young comrades, that's happened to them, adopted the name of Sid French, I think. Oh, Sid, Sid Fox, that's right. They decided to change their name in order to protect their families in South Africa. If anything should have occurred, the news got back, they would be in difficulty. So he adopted the name, actually, I think it was one of the ship's crew. There's an historical precedent of that, because Trotsky may or may not know, his name is Bronstein. 
changes him for Trotsky is one of his jailers, actually, in the Tsarist prison. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. called Trotsky. So he just, he just chose that name like that. I don't think this sailor ever discovered uh, what occurred to his name subsequently. But anyway, I can't deal in detail. It's impossible at the limited time <coughs> which I possess. <coughs> With the early days of the movement, it's an interesting subject. Just to say, and I, I assert this quite firmly, that Ted Grant and other communists like Ralph Lee, who subsequently joined him, built the first genuine Trotskyist organization in, in Britain. There were other groups, but they were frankly unimportant. This was an attempt to build some of these up. This is ridiculous. The first genuine Trotskyist organization in Britain was called the Workers' International. Subsequently, during the Second World War, they fused with other groups and they became the Revolutionary Communist Party. It wasn't a mass organization, but they did very serious work. For example, during the war, at a time particularly after 1941, when the Communist Party was opposing all strikes and accusing anyone that organized organize a strike of being an agent of Hitler, stuff of this uh, character, uh, they, they led a very, a very important strike in, in the north, in Tyneside, the Apprentices' Strike. 44, I think it was, Robert, correct me. Uh, they also had a very interesting position on the army. You know, the Communists were not pacifists, we're not pacifists. Trotsky advised that all the Communists should join the army, conduct their military services efficiently, and carry out revolutionary propaganda inside the armed forces, which they did to some effect. For example, in, in, in the Middle East, the Eighth Army, that's the army that won the Battle of al the, because the ruling class had to maintain some semblance of democracy, even a gangster like church had to pay lip service to democracy, they let the troops have what was known as the Forces Parliament, where they could debate politics, they could have a Labour candidate and a Tory candidate and a Liberal and so on. It, it meant nothing, of course, but it, 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 it was just a, a gesture to, to so-called democracy. The chairman of the Forces Parliament in Egypt was a member of the Fourth International. He stood as a member of the Fourth International and was elected. And by the way, when the Stalinists tried to make a fuss about the apprentice strike, that this is fascism and these are agents of Hitler, the Eighth Army had a bulletin and they carried it on the front page. It's the right to strike that we're fighting for. That was the answer to the Stalinists. So they did quite uh, heroic work. Persecuted. You can read the MI5 report, it's open now, it makes it interesting. They were infiltrated by the police, Ted told an interesting story about that. They had a battered old printing press, and they didn't have any money. But there was this chap, a mysterious gentleman, joined them. And Ted said, I knew it once he was a police I said, How did you know? He said, Well, because of the size of his feet, the size of his shoes. <laughs> For those that don't know, British policemen are supposed to have large feet. Anyway, there we are. His name was, I think, Detective Inspector Jones, I believe. And he was in for that. He was always asking questions about them and asking for all the documents. And so they played a trick on him, actually. They, there was an issue, an issue of the paper. They skipped an issue. It said, still number five, number six came up. And he was going desperate. Where's number five? <laughs> of course, it didn't exist. He put it on the secret plans for the insurrection. They made it a condition that he gave large amounts of money, which he did quite, uh, quite gladly. They used that money to purchase the transitional program, or rather to, to produce the transitional program of Trotsky. When later on the leaders were arrested at the time of the uh, Tyneside Apprentice strike, uh, and, and Jock Hassan, uh, he bumped into this, uh, no, I'm telling you, like, he was interrogated by the police, when they asked him, where did you get the money, money from to produce these things. He said, well, ask, ask Detective Inspector Jones. <laughs> he, he paid for the transitional program. Anyway, it was a very successful uh, but, it, but it, in order to clarify the general position, and by the way, let's deal with this question of the Fourth International, which sometimes is raised. What were the relations between the RCP and the so-called Fourth International? Let's, let's spell this out, because uh, there's still some people raise this, this issue. The Fourth International, really speaking, was an abortion. It never took off. And particularly Trotsky's assassination played uh, a disastrous role. If you think about it, the task which Trotsky had before the war was uh, a superhuman task. 
Not only were they oppressed and hunted and persecuted by the Stalinists and by the GPU, but also the, the material which Trotsky had to deal with was unsatisfactory, to be, to be honest about it. They were the, the kind of, it was the, the, the wreckage, the, the, the flotsam and jetsam that was left over from a terrible historical defeat, which was the victim of Stalinism in Russia. And a lot of them were demoralized people, confused, confused ideas. Some of the, many of them were anti-Stalinists, but they were anti-Stalinists for the wrong reasons. You know, anarchists and Bordigists and goodness knows what. Trotsky had a lot, of, a lot of trouble with this. In fact, when he was in France, you can read a book called The Crisis in the French Section, in which is an interview, he had an interview with the leader of the, uh, of the young sources, the French young sources, called Fred Zeller. He was Zeller complained bitterly about the French Trotskyists. By the way, I understand why many people are hostile to Trotskyism. And Ted understood it also. The people who parade and masquerade as Trotskyists, ultra left uh, idiots in the main, petty bourgeois types. Uh, Zeller complained bitterly, and Trotsky, I noticed in the text, he didn't defend the French Trotsky. All he said was, well, you know, sometimes you've got to work with the material you've got. That's all he said. And that summed it up. Probably the best of them was James Cannon. I don't look much like Cannon myself, but there we are. And he played a very bad role. I won't go into the details, you find them in the book. But in any case, when Trotsky was murdered, let's put it this way, and Stalin knew what he was doing, by the way. I recently read the book by the man who organized Trotsky's the chap of the name of uh, Suda Platov. And Suda Platov actually quoted Stalin in, 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 twice. S Stalin said, look, there are no well-known, there are no uh, decent leaders of the Fourth International other than Trotsky. Kill Trotsky and the whole thing will collapse. But, uh, he understood. That's correct. It wasn't wrong. When Trotsky was murdered, <coughs> the so-called leaders of the Fourth were completely all at sea. They had no idea. It's not possible, again, to go into detail, but it may be a rough idea. You see, in order to have a serious revolutionary work, you require a perspective. You really like perspectives, perspectives for Britain, world perspectives, and so on. But what is a perspectives document? There's nothing mystical about a perspectives document. It's merely, an, if you like, it's a conditional hypothesis. It's a condition based on whatever the information you God. You're trying to, pe to, to piece together what you think is likely to happen. To quote a, a military analogy, because there are many analogies between the war between the classes and the war between nations. Any general would go into battle, before he goes into battle, he works on the battle plan. A general that went into battle or sent his troops into battle without a battle plan would be a very irresponsible man. And he would try to anticipate different, he would try to different conditions and so on and, and work out the best strategy for his troops. If he didn't have such a plan, it would be irresponsible, yes. Yes, but a general that clung to the plan without taking into consideration the realities on the battlefield would, do, would lose it, the, the battle, would cut his army to ribbons. For example, the weather changes, it rains, there's mud, you can't move the artillery, you didn't foresee this. The, the enemy moved in a way that you didn't anticipate and so on. You have to follow. In other words, you have to correct the perspectives in accordance with experience. Otherwise, you fall into idealism of the, of the worst sort. In 1938, Trotsky worked at a, a perspective for the Second World War. It was mainly based with an analogy with what happened after the First World War. However, let's spell it out. Trotsky's perspective of 1938 was falsified by history. It was wrong. He made a mistake. Yes, but you see, as Napoleon pointed out, Napoleon said, war is the most complex of all equations. It's very difficult to anticipate the other. And the outcome of the Second World the Second World War developed differently to what anyone could have expected. Even the greatest genius could not uh, have anticipated what occurred. Not only Trotsky made a mistake, Stalin was fundamentally mistaken, Hitler was fundamentally mistaken, Churchill and Roosevelt were also fundamentally mistaken. None of them foresaw what would happen. For example, Trotsky thought that the Soviet Union would be defeated, or rather, put it differently, that under a Stalinist leadership it would be impossible to, to survive the, the Second World War. That was wrong. Hitler had the same idea. He said in 1940, I think, 
He said, no, he said, uh, it'll be easy. We will kick the door and the whole rotten edifice will fall down. Quote from Hitler. He said, because they, why? Because they don't have good generals. Because Stalin killed all them. It's a fact. He killed all the decent generals. Mm -hmm. Thousands of them. Yeah. A genius like Tukhachevsky, who worked out the theory of the Blitzkrieg before the Germans. The Germans copied it from Tukhachevsky, as a matter of fact. It's a fact. Replaced by someone like uh, Budioni, who thought that the Second World War would be fought by cavalry. <laughs> oh, yes, At the beginning of the war, Hitler's armies advanced like a hot, like a hot knife through butter. Millions of Soviet soldiers were, were encircled and captured without a fight, without firing a shot. Planes were destroyed on the ground because of Stalin's gross miscalculation. This was a matter of record. You could easily demonstrate this. Is well known. Yes, but. Yes, but. The Soviet working class remained loyal to the, the revolution, in spite of Stalin, because of Stalin, remained loyal to the revolution, fought like tigers, not only that. What the Second World War in Russia demonstrated was the colossal superior, superiority of a nationalized planned economy. Because most of the industries were in the West, they put 1,500 gigantic factories, they, dism they dismantled them, put them on trains, shipped them east of the Euros and reconstructed them. Could that be done on the basis of capitalism? You tell me. I think not. And one, one million men were, were, and women were shipped east. Within a year, the Soviet Union was outproducing the Germans in armaments and everything else. And therefore, in the Battle of Stalingrad, and Ted insisted particularly in the Battle of Kursk, that was very enthusiastic about the Red Army, by the way, and its victories. But of course, they began the biggest uh, advance in history. And of course, Churchill and Roosevelt were also miscalculated because Churchill thought that the, that the Soviet Union would be defeated. The real position of the, of the British ruling class and the Americans was this. We wait until they're both exhausted, that's to say the Germans and the Russians, and then we'll step in and mop both of them up. That was the idea. It didn't work. And if they hadn't, they delayed opening the second front, waiting for this to happen, until they saw that uh, the Red Army was advancing so fast that if they didn't open the second front, they'd have met the Red Army on the English Channel. It's an actual fact. So therefore, the, the whole situation worked out differently. What did this mean concretely for the Trotskyists? Well, it meant, first of all, the victory of the Soviet Union in the war meant that Stalinism was reinforced for a whole period. Colossally, the authority of the Soviet Union was here. Plus then, of course, in Eastern Europe, the Chinese Revolution. And therefore, the road to the uh, communist workers, the start was blocked. That road was blocked. On the other hand, you see, after the First World War, there was an economic collapse in Europe. After the second, Trotsky was right on one thing, absolutely. Right. He predicted a wave of revolutions in, East, in, in Europe, and that was correct. In Italy, in Greece, in France, even in Britain, that the army came back with their guns and voted massively for a Labour government against Churchill, which they didn't expect. There was a, a revolutionary situation in Europe. Yes, but the old leaderships, that's to say the Stalinists and the Social Democrats, succeeded in controlling that and betraying it. They betrayed the revolution in France, in, it was the Stalinists in France, in Italy, in Greece, I've just returned from Greece now, <coughs> two days ago. Uh, and therefore that, uh, and of course in Britain, the Labour Party. Well, what, what about the Labour Party? The other possibility for approaching workers would be that the Social Democratic workers. But you see, the question is this. Once American imperialism realized the danger, and American imperialism, by the way, emerged from the Second World War, with its industry intact, not a single bomb dropped on their territory, as far as I know. Two thirds of the world's gold supply was in Fort Knox. They were in a powerful position. They could dictate terms. They saw the danger of revolution in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. They saw the threat of communism, as they put it, and therefore they massively underwrote European capitalism in the Marshall Plan, something which didn't happen after the First World War. In Britain, the Labour government was, for the first and only time in history, actually carried out its programme. They carried it out. 
They've nationalised steel, they've nationalised coal, they've nationalised the railways, they have the national health. These are colossal gains. And therefore, if you spoke to, uh, I think, people have seen it. Uh, if, you, if you spoke to a labour worker in 1945, 1946, and said, well, you know, the reformism uh, is no good, and they're gonna be, your leaders will betray you, we turn and say, what are you talking about? Look, look at everything they've done. You're impatient. Wait another five years, and we'll win the next election, and we'll fi finish the job. This kind of thing. Logically. Therefore, if you want to ask the question, why was it that the forces of Trotskyism, I would say the forces of genuine Marxism, were isolated for a whole period. It was mainly because of, not because of Nicholas, <laughs> it was mainly because of objective circumstances. The uh, betrayal of Stalinism and social democracy, which was headed off the revolution, provided it the political precondition for a new boom in capitalism. Not a crisis, not a slum. But the biggest economic upswing in the history of capitalism, yes, Bigger than the Industrial Revolution. Colossal upswing. Which only finished in 1973, really. The, the, the reconstruction itself only finished, according to the United Nations, in 58. Just the, the business of reconstructing uh, the shattered cities in Europe and Japan. And therefore, with the living in, workers are very realistic people, you know. If capitalism seems to be doing the business, they're not going to worry too much about it revolution and socialism and communism. And therefore, for a whole historical period after the Second World War, Marxism was, was isolated. Unfortunately, the so-called leaders of the Fourth International refused to accept reality. They refused to understand, they couldn't understand the evidence of their senses. They continued to repeat like parrots what Trotsky had written in 1930. In other words, they read the words of Trotsky without understanding the method. That's typical of many so-called Marxists. What is necessary to understand the method? You can't just maintain, like a general who stubbornly uh, maintains a battle plan when the conditions have changed. Therefore, there was a whole series of uh, problems in terms of crises. There's another problem here. Where you have a leadership, that, can, that, is political, that has political and moral authority, they can answer any, there's no fear of criticism. Take the Congresses of the, of the Communist International, when it was a Communist International, after the revolution, there were many disagreements. Many of the, Lenin had a lot of trouble with the German leaders, the British, the British in particular, the ultra less, the Dutch, the Italians and so on. It would never have occurred to Lenin to expel these people, or to take administrative measures or to insult them. He, he used this to, to debate and discuss, not because he was some kind of a liberal, sentimental person. It's only through the weapon of discussion, free discussion, that you, that you can develop the case. Look at the history of Bolshevism. The whole history of the Bolshevik Party is, is a constant discussion of thrashing out ideas in order to clarify our ideas and work out the, an adequate program. The problem is if you have leaders that don't have this uh, that are unable to answer, it's too much of a temptation to resort to the apparatus, to expulsions, to splits, to insults, and so on. It's what we would call Zenobiaism, the type of thing that Zenobiaism got up to before Stalin. Stalinism is on a, in a different scale. But the, the, the methods of, of these leaders, of, of Mandel, of Hansen, of Cannon, of uh, Pablo, of Frank, and all the others, were Zenobiaism. And therefore, you had one split after another. Let me say this, you can check the records. There was a conference in 1946, the first one after the war. The only section that posed a question in relation to the uh, perspectives that said it was wrong, that we should change, was the British RCP. Ted didn't go, because he said, how knew what it would be like. He wasn't very enthusiastic. But the Commons went and put the case. They lost the vote. And because the leaders of the international were not able to answer the British Congress, they resorted, as you could expect, to xenophobic like methods, to maneuvers, to tricks. They developed a monster in Britain. Some of you may have, some of you may have heard of this chap called Jerry Healy. And an old ILP once said to me, described him as a, a horrible little monster, which is about accurate. 
He, 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 was, he was the original Pabloite, the supporter of Pablo, the supporter in, in Britain. But anyway, as a result of this, the, the fourth was the RCP was destroyed. And of course, in a, under very difficult circumstances, Ted had to build up again from nothing, from almost nothing. A tiny handful of people. Mainly in Liverpool, the Dean's family, Jimmy Dean's family. <coughs> Completely and absolutely isolated. For a long time, it was like crossing a desert. It reminds me of what the Bible says. The comments know I like to quote the Bible. A voice crying in the wilderness. And that's what it was. Only nobody hears a voice in the wilderness. There was, seemed no hope, and many people dropped out, became demoralized, and so on. There was a general shift to the to the uh, to the right. Ted remained absolutely firm, like a rock. No, nothing seemed to ever disappoint Ted Grant. He was always optimistic, always enthusiastic. I mean that. I mean, years ago, I went, I think it was about in the 1970s, I went to Dublin on political business, and I met a, a former comrade, called, a man called Matt Berrigan. He was an important trade union leader in Dublin. I think he became the general secretary of the, the TUC, the equivalent of the TUC in itself. Nice man personally, but completely uh, cynical and skeptical as happens when you leave the Marxist movement. You become old very quickly. And he said, he said excuse the accent, he said, do you know Ted Grant? I said, yes, I know Ted Grant. Oh, is he still optimistic? <laughs> he says, yes, he's still optimistic. Oh, he says, well, let's face it, he said, Ted Grant would be optimistic if he'd fallen off a cliff. <laughs> Which is probably true. That was also, but the optimism wasn't a false optimism. It was a bit based on the absolute conviction of the correctness of the ideas of Marxism. Let me give you a case in point. You wrote a very important document, I think it was in 58 or 59, called Will There Be a Slump? Nowadays, that seems to be a strange question. It wasn't strange at the time. Because everyone and his uncle was uh, convinced that there wasn't going to be a first, that Marx was wrong. Marxism was wrong. That there couldn't be another crisis of war production, there couldn't be another slump. Ted demolished that very successfully in that. He explained the reasons for the post war upswing, you know. Now it's important to realize that because it took a long time. But frankly, uh, now the Marx Marxism is entirely vindicated. The present crisis is not the subject of this talk. We can discuss it in, in questions if you wish. But it's a, it's a, a, a laboratory specimen of a massive crisis of overproduction, which Ted firmly predicted. One other, he made also a very interesting analysis of the colonial revolution of Cuba, which I think some of the, some of the comments have interested. By the way, Ted was very enthusiastic about the Cuban revolution. But it didn't take, every, everyone would agree, that it didn't take the, the classical form of Russia in 1970. Ted explains the reason for this. There are a number of reasons. Firstly, of course, the, 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 what, what we have in the colonial world in different forms is this, that as Trotsky explained in his theory of the permanent revolution, which is the only theory that explains the, the colonial revolution, he explained what's the basis of the theory of the, the permanent revolution is as follows, that under modern conditions it is impossible to solve the problems of colonial countries or ex-colonial countries under capitalism through the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie will play a reactionary counter-revolutionary role as night follows day. And that's a fact. The whole history of the last 60 years demonstrates that, for goodness sake. Both in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Asia, in India, in Pakistan. Just look at, look at the mess. Look at the, they, in some respects, these people are worse. I know Pakistan very well. In some respects, they're worse off now than what they were under British, British rule. And that's saying something. And they're more subjugated to capital, not to imperialism than what they were. Though they formerly independent, the independence means precisely nothing at all. Because they're dominated by the world market. Unfortunately, the delay of the socialist revolution in the advanced capitalist countries, I mean, today it doesn't take place, uh, and the absence of a genuine communist party in these countries means that the colonial revolution has taken a number of distorted forms, very distorted forms. Peculiar forms, peculiar animals of all sorts, which Ted explained in his theory of proletarian Bonapartism. Incidentally, I'll, I'll, I'll say this quite clearly, I'm proud of the fact that the international Marxist tendency, Ted Grant's tendency, 
were the only ones to understand the, the uh, Venezuelan revolution in advance. The left, the so-called left, how that however, the more I see of the left, the more I despair. <laughs> Good heavens above. And by the way, Chavez was head and shoulders, say what you like about Chavez, he was head and shoulders of the, the leftists of the left leaders in Europe were a pathetic bunch, really pathetic bunch, even compared to the past. We understood the role of Chavez and the, and the military. The reason why the left took a hostile position, or didn't understand, is because he was an army officer. He didn't bother us because we'd already analyzed things like Afghanistan and Ethiopia and other, <coughs> Syria even, <coughs> years ago. The, the colonial revolution took it story from. Anyway, uh, rather than speak on this, which is a separate subject, please read the relevant documents. We're publishing Ted's writings. You can read them for yourself. But there's one other item which I must come to the point. Otherwise, the chairman's going to get annoyed. To do with tactics. In the field of tactics and party building, Ted was streets ahead of anybody else. He wrote a very important document in the late 50s called Problems of Entrism, in which he explained that the following, that historically, for historical reasons, the forces of Marxism have been thrown back. This is indisputable. It's indisputable. He also explained that if you look, and by the way, he didn't invent this. He based himself on Lenin's left-wing communism, a masterpiece, one of Lenin's masterpieces. Here's a document that really sums up the whole history of Bolshevism as in organizational and tactical terms. You couldn't improve on it. And Trotsky's writings on the mass organizations in the 1930s, which develops Lenin's ideas. And Ted's, uh, Ted, in turn, developed Trotsky's idea, idea. If you look at the entire, I'll try to summarize this. If you look at the entire history of the working class in Europe, in advanced countries, in colonial countries, it's a bit different. It's a bit different, different class structure and so on. But you take any of the advanced capitalist countries in Europe, it's a law. They always, not sometimes, they always, in the first instance, will express themselves through the existing mass traditional organizations of the class. First of all, the trade unions, no matter how bankrupt or right wing they might be, or corrupt they might be. But secondly, also the parties, which in Europe means the social democracy and the communist parties. Of course, these are the, the two great movements which, which have been created by the working class. The working class doesn't create a party every two minutes, good heavens above. I only, know, I only know of two occasions where the proletariat has created a new party. The social democracy, in the days of uh, Engels, and the Communist International, the Communist Party, full stop. And I'll say this, all the attempts of small groups to set themselves up against these mass organizations are doomed to failure. <coughs> Hopeless and inevitable failure. The work, look, the working class does not understand small organizations, even if you've got the, even if your programs are 100% correct. They don't understand them, they never will understand them, they don't even notice they exist. Of course, these groups always are offering united fronts to the labor movement, like, like an ant offering a united front to the elephant. The elephant doesn't notice the ant, just steps on him as he goes past. No, no, no. The workers, if you think of it, it's not rocket science, what I'm saying. It isn't rocket science. In spite of the right wing leaders, no, 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 no need to tell me about the crimes of Miliband, rather less than the crimes of Noska and Seidelman in Germany, which didn't stop the Germans workers from going to the social democracy first, before that enters into crisis and then you have splits and creation of mass left and left and current. Now this marvelously profound idea was worked out by Ted and is correct. Of course our rivals on the left didn't accept this. In fact they had a good laugh about us. Why not? Why not? You see, look, when I joined this organization in 1960, you know how many we were? Not more than a sitting in this room now, less, I would think. Not more than 30 people. 1960. We had no money. We had no full-timers. Ted was working in the... Uh, selling brushes, actually. Then he, then he worked in uh, the in the telephone exchange for some time. No full-timers, no office, no money. Okay. 30 people, and nobody would have given a plug nickel for our chances of success. You know, but we had one thing which none of the other groups had, and never will have. 
we have the ideas of Marxism, correct perspectives, a correct understanding of how the working class moves, okay, and correct methods of work. That's sufficient. Quite sufficient. We participated in the labor youth in the name, in the exorcist, uh, which is wrecked, unfortunately, by ultra-left uh, antics, by, by the uh, Heliots. But now we still persisted. Labour won the, the election, first time in 30 years, they won the election in 1964. They came to power and naturally carried out a right-wing policy. I hope nobody will stand up there and say, ah, but Alan, but Ed Miliband's going to carry out a right-wing policy. Of course he will. They always do. That's the historic function of the social democracy. And to prepare the way for the right-wing, that's perfectly true. But look at the process. Look at the process concretely. It also makes me laugh. I hear people today say, ah, Alan, but the, the, the liberties have never been as right-wing as they are now. Really? Never heard of Ramsey MacDonald? The trade unions have never been as bureaucratic and right-wing as they are now. Now, I happen to have a fairly long memory of some things. Let me give you a list of the general secretaries of trade unions that I remember in the 19, up to 1970, 1960s. Uh, the AU, the Main Industrial Engineering Workers Union. General Secretary, Lord Carroll. <coughs> the uh, Railway Workers Union, General Secretary Sir Sidney Green, okay. the GMB, the, the Boilermakers Union, General Secretary Lord Cooper. Shall I go on? They're all the same. It's like, it's like a rogues gallery <laughs> of extreme right wing gangsters. Okay. And of course, the trade unions in Britain, that's the point. Nobody knows where the trade unions end and the Labour Party begins. The, the, uh, these right wing union leaders. <coughs> Control of labor. But every conference, the, right, the, the, the rank and file would vote for left wing resolutions or disarmament. Then the, the, the trade union block vote. This is 10 grand scope, it's not the trade union. One million votes finished. By the way, some of the left reformers wanted to break away from the unions. We said, no, 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 no. We're in favor of the union uh, presence because in the future, the opposite will be the case. And by God, that's taking place now. If the unions will express, the, the left would move, move once the workers begin to move. But let's go back to it. By 1969, the Labour Party, the Wilson government, was completely discredited. They were carrying out, a, attempting to carry out anti trade union legislation in place of strike. There was a big crisis in the party. For the first time in memory, the, the, the miners were threatening to disappear. They never did, but they were, miners' lodges were threatening to disappear. Such was the hatred of the, of the Labour right wing. Deservedly, they then lost the general election in 1970. Now, in the meantime, listen up. All the left groups at that time, when I joined, were in the Labour Party. Every man jack of them. The SWP, then known as the IS, the International Socialist. They published a paper which wasn't the Socialist Worker, it was the Labour Worker. Check it out. Okay, complete opportunities, by the way. They supported troops going into Northern Ireland in 1969. And other little things like that. It's another matter. And uh, yeah, they, were all, they all left, one after the other, empirical, they're empiricists, they have no method, they have no understanding. They left to set up their little outfits outside. The Mandalites were extreme right-wingers, extreme opportunists, suddenly become extreme student left-wingers. Ali, what's his name? Tariq Ali, or as a woman who used to go him, Ali Tank. We stayed. Now, because of the antics of the ultra-left, the, the YS was severely impaired. The bureaucracy, they didn't close it down, as they'd closed it down in the past, but they took away all our rights. At the, at the annual congress of the Young Socialists, we were not allowed to elect the leadership, we were not allowed to elect the chairman, we were not allowed to control the newspaper, and we were not allowed to discuss any political subject, only organizational matters, and matters pertaining to youth. Naturally, no international subjects, because the Vietnam War was taking place at the time. I remember one bright, bright spark, it must have been in 69, moved a resolution that this Congress expresses its solidarity with all members of the Viet Cong under 25 years of age. It didn't work. <laughs> the rule out of order. We stayed. Okay? Now, the joke, how they laughed. They're laughing now. I say, let them laugh. How they laughed. What a good time they had. Look at the 
The job was going around, was doing the rounds. In the branches of the Labour Party, you always find two sorts of persons. Oh, little old ladies knitting at the back. A bit sexist, that one. Thing. Little old ladies knitting at the back. And young men selling the military. <laughs> it was a bit exaggerated, but it wasn't. It, <laughs> it, was, it was more or less true. Labour Party was empty, of course. Yes, but they had no perspective. Labour lost the election. Within a year, with the right-wing Tory government, the, the unions swung sharply to the left. The old general secretaries were removed. You had the rise of people like Jones and Scanlon. This country was on the brink of a general strike when they, when they threatened to put uh, jock, dockers in, say, Pentonville dockers in London, that was. The Hootsie Division was radicalised, and the Labour Party, in opposition, swung sharply to the left. The rise of leaders like Tony Benn, Eric Heffer, we got all the rights of the young sources were returned. And we, my friends, were in the right place at the right time. That is the uh, business. I'm dealing now with the militant. The militant took off like that. Of course, this, the whole nature of the period changed, as it's changing now. Revolution in Greece, the overthrow of the colonels in 74. Revolution in, in Portugal. 74, 75, led by officers, by the way, young officers. Yeah. Uh, so it's not the first, we, we understood this at the time. Therefore, Hugo Chavez didn't take us by surprise at all. Revolution in Spain, which Anna and myself participated in, personally, at the time. Mass strikes in France, mass strikes in Italy, mass strikes in Britain, yes, believe it or not. The ruling class was seriously what? They were even considering a coup d'etat, even in Britain. Brigadier Frank Kitson wrote a book at the time, Low, low Intensity Operations, prepare, preparing for war against the Labour government. Okay, and the militant took off like that. I went to Spain at the time and built quite a strong section using the same methods as in, uh, in, in Britain. Now, I won't deal at length with the militant, except because there's, there's a time, except, except to say this. Starting with a very weak base, because we were extremely weak, far, far weaker than what we are now. We built the most powerful, successful Trotsky's movement in history. How successful? Let me give you a few figures. At, the, at its peak, we had on, on, on paper at least 8,000 members. Okay? We had 200 full-timers, some of them were in this room, former full-timers. 100 in London, a, a huge factory in, in Hackneywick, with a huge printing press able to produce a daily newspaper. 100 full-timers and 100 in the provinces. In that building, you walked down a corridor, there was a whole group of full-timers on either side for every union. We took control of the CPSA, which is the main civil service union. Oh, and we got three members of parliament, which the Communist Party never achieved. You might say, oh yes, but it's opportunities, we present yourself as Labour Party. No, 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 that won't wash, my friend, that won't wash. Everybody in his uncle knew who these MPs were, because the press denounced them. These are Trotskyists, these are Reds, look at what you're doing, Mr. Kinnock must take action and so on. It led to some funny, it, I'll, I'll tell you this. In the late 1980s, there was nobody, but nobody in the whole of the British Isles that did not know about the militant, militant no matter how apolitical they were, which was on the news all the time. We've been attacked all that, we've been attacked because the ruling class was afraid, was concerned, seriously concerned. They are concerned about the what Jimmy Dean used to call the piss balling sets, excuse my French. They're concerned about the SDP, people like that. Not in the slightest bit concerned. This, however, was different. A Marxist organization takes control of the Labour youth, has got a member of the Labour's executive, has got three members of parliament, has got I don't know how many councillors up and down the country. Uh, what's his name? Michael. Uh, Michael Crick, he's on uh, Channel 4 often, wrote a book the, uh, called The Militant, which is uh, actually is quite accurate in, in many respects, although it wasn't complete. Crick described The Militant as the fifth political party in Britain. Fifth because the Liberals and the, uh, the uh, Social Democrats were not uh, united at that time. Actually, he meant the fourth. In other words, Tories, Labour, Liberals, Lib Dems, and the Militant. Correct. 
I repeat, the Communist Party had never got within, within any distance of any of those things. It was a staggering success. We, we got control of the city of Liverpool. That's not bad, I think. We controlled Liverpool Council. We led a strike, a struggle of Liverpool involving tens of thousands of people against the Thatcher government. Or oh, the, the anti poor tax struggle, which they, they all talk about nowadays. We organised that. Be clear about it. I was present, Rob was present, at meetings of the executive where we took this decision to set up a national union to oppose the, the poor tax. Rob personally organised the demonstration in Trafalgar Square, which ended in a riot. It wasn't our intention, it wasn't our fault. It's another matter. The anti poor tax tax was involved how many millions from? 14. 14 million people were mobilised by the militant tenants, by the anti poor tax union. That brought Thatcher down. They don't say that these days. You know? Oh, she just retired because there was a cabal of Tory leaders that decided to get rid of it. Yes, and why did they decide to get rid of it? The, the poll tax was the last straw. They thought this is dangerous. So we were responsible for the fall of Thatcher. I was <laughs> state that bluntly. Remarkable successes, yes, but the problem is this. Uh, Ted Grant said, sometimes success can be more dangerous than failure. There's a problem, there's a human problem, if you like. Some of the leaders of the militant allowed these successes to go to their heads. Look, they were very big successes. They thought it was quite a big organization. Yes, but the labor movement in Britain consists of millions. 8,000 is still small in comparison to what would be required in order to lead us, but the call a spade a shovel, to lead the socialist revolution. We still had a long way to go. It's true we were being attacked, there were expulsions, yes, but don't exaggerate that. I think the total number of expulsions carried out was about 200. Mm -hmm. you know. And by the way, the expulsions didn't harm us. Those expelled comments but we weren't, weren't active in the Labour Party anyway. They were doing other activities. On the contrary, the expulsions assisted us. We were growing. The problem was not that. The problem was that a section of the leaders, as too often happens on the left, they got big ideas. You could see it, you know, the arrogance of a section of the folk, the young folks I was in particular. At the group around Peter Taffy, you know, we're the boys, you know, there was this arrogance, which gave them a militant a bad name in the end. I mean, I can understand some people were turned off by this. Quite right, I understand that. They decided, in their wisdom, we don't need the Labour Party anymore. Although they weren't honest enough to state that, they concealed that fact consistently to the members. They never admitted this when we challenged them. Started to put up candidates against the Labour Party in Liverpool. They thought they were going to win. They belly flopped completely. They were smashed. They did the same thing in Scotland. They failed again miserably. Ted and I and Rob and other comrades and Anna opposed this. Tried to, tried to oppose it. In the past, I can say this, our organisation was extremely democratic. You can believe me or not, extremely democratic. As long as Ted was uh, But these guys, they couldn't cope. They couldn't handle uh, opposition. They couldn't answer the argument. And therefore, in typical sectarian style, they used the apparatus. We were expelled. Ted Grant, the founder of the organization, as Ted says, no, the sector always expelled the leader. It's the usual, <laughs> usual pantomime, you know. And therefore, we had to proceed again. Twenty years ago, this occurred. I, I think they thought that we'd be liquidated. Well, you see, we're not exactly liquidated. What is true, however, is that we had to set out from, in a very difficult, objective situation. You had the, the boom in capitalism, the Thatcherite counter-revolution, sharp movement to the right of the Labour Party, the rise of Blairism, and of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union, perhaps of Stalinism, general demoralization, despair, and so on, and a massive ideological onslaught by the defenders of capitalism. You know, you remember that. The death of uh, the end of communism, the end of socialism, the end of Marxism, the end of history, said Francis Fukuyama. I remember that, yeah. I remember Ted's reaction. By the way, Ted had predicted the fall of Stalinism as early as 1974, for certain reasons I have no time to explain. He predicted that. He said the following. He said, no, the collapse of the, the Soviet Union is, is a great historical drama. Of course, it was reactionary, but against the, the restoration of capitalism in Russia. That's right. It's a great historical He said, however, seen in retrospect, it will be seen as merely the prelude to a far greater drama, which will be the crisis of capitalism. 
which you see now, taking place. He was dead right. It's true that the, the sun was delayed longer than what we expected. We, we thought it would occur earlier. The reason it didn't occur earlier is because the bourgeoisie attempted to avoid a slump, in America in particular, by generating a colossal amount of credit, unprecedented amounts of credit, which is Marx expense. If you do that, all that you do is postpone the slump by artificially increasing demand at the cost of aggravating it when it occurs. And that's the position now. That's why they can't get out of it. And therefore, how do we finish that? Well, are we worried about splits and stuff like that? Well, well, first of all, is there any recipe for splits? Is somebody avoiding splits? Well, if there is, Lenin didn't know it. He had plenty of splits. Marx didn't know it. Trotsky certainly <coughs> didn't know it. I don't know it. Splits are it's part of life, comrades. You come under the pressure. The Marxist movement comes under pressure of all kinds. Opportunists, sectarian, all sorts of which we have to resist. It's true that we were thrown back, but not to our starting point. We picked ourselves up. Internationally, by the way, we had the majority. We had the majority. And I'll say this. I'll just finish. We man managed to put together the forces, uh, young forces, new forces. Not all of them here, but I think they've been exhausted after the demonstration this morning. doesn't matter. Our, our, our progress is considerable. Let's come back from Greece. The Congress is doing very well. They just launched the communist tendency of Syriza. Here's the party paper, Sunday edition, page 50, full page interview with yours truly. You'll find the translation in the, uh, on our website. No, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. We're doing, but, uh, but we do even better with your support, that is. You know, we could always do with extra, extra help. But I'll just say this. All the time that I've been in this organization, I've been since 1960, it's a long time too long for my, my liking, but nevertheless, I've never changed my ideas, fundamental ideas. I've never changed my organization either. Other people have split, that's their problem. But the ideas of Ted Grant are the correct ideas. You know, I become increasingly convinced of that truth the older I get. And I'll say this to you. I've seen all sorts since I've been in this movement. I've seen good things, I've seen bad things, I've seen successes, I've seen failures. But I've never seen, I'll say this, the ideas of Ted Grant, the ideas of the international Marxist tendency, the political and moral authority of this tendency internationally has never been higher than what it is now. Never. Take our website, marxist.com, which is produced daily. Nicholas, I think, told me, I'm not very clever on these statistics, but was it 2.4 million visits Pages. last year? Pardon? Page views. Pa page views. It's not bad. Produced in I don't know how many different languages. It's, it's all there, including Russian, Chinese, Vietnamese, and so on and so forth. In Venezuela, we have a colossal uh, authority. I was there a couple of weeks ago. Again, I was interviewed on the, te on the television, quarter of an hour in prime time, half an hour in Telesur, and so on and so forth. Cuba, which many comments are interested in. You, know, you see, that's the good thing. And I'll say this in the past, we weren't speaking to each other. I, I considered to be a part of the communist family, the great communist family. There was a time you couldn't speak, you know, to Trotskyists and so-called Stalinists. Communists couldn't speak. Cubans, said, oh, I've been invited to Cuba, as, as you know. So I've, I've spoken at meetings of the Communist Party. I've had a good uh, reception. My books have been published in Cuba, as well as, as well as Venezuela. There's a, in Ireland also, it's comical, the sex used to go, oh, look at your position in Ireland. I said, what are you talking about? What position in Ireland are you talking about, you fool? These guys, the SWB, supported the sending of British troops, which we opposed. We were the only ones that opposed. The Communist Party was in favor of it, the SWP, the Labour Left, all, all in favor. They're going to defend the Catholics, 69 of them. Ch check it out. Check it out. We were the only ones that opposed it. And then they did a 180 degrees uh, jump over our head. Unconditional support for the provisional IRA for individual terrorism, a criminal policy. <coughs> 30,000 dead? Is it? How many dead? 3,000. 30,000. And it's failed completely. Uh, the the uni unification of Ireland is further off now than what it's ever been in history. The working class is divided down the middle. But I'll just say this serious Irish Republicans, and there are many, 
Sourceless Republicans are seeking contacts with this international. And we're in constant discussions with them. And they listen to our ideas with respect and with great interest because they understand. This whole damn policy has failed, the tactics have failed, would require a different tactic based on class politics, which is the only possible solution. So I would argue, he must have made mistakes, who doesn't make mistakes? Only God doesn't make mistakes, and he doesn't exist. No, no, we would say, however, on all the fundamental questions, I would argue that we've been shown to be correct. That the authority of these ideas is, is considerable, that it is growing, we're open to dialogue, we're not close to dialogue, we've been prepared to discuss with any honest group of people in the labor movement, nationally or internationally. But ultimately, and I'll finish on that, we can be confident, confident of our victory because capitalism itself has nothing to offer anymore. It's in crisis, it's totally. Not just economic crisis, it's a moral crisis. It's a crisis of philosophy, it's a crisis of art, culture. You, of ideology, of religion, anything, anything, it's a rotten, this society stinks. It is, rot, it is rotting on its feet. And millions of people are beginning to understand that, not just the activists, not just us. Ordinary men, women, in Greece, I went to Greece, first time in 14, in 12 years. I spoke to the meeting in Athens, quite a big meeting, last Friday. I said, look, I was, I've not been here for, for, for 12 years. I've come back to a different country. This is a different country. These are different people. Because if I'd have, in the past, I'd gone to a worker in Athens and argued with the sources to evolution, well, he'd be quite polite and quite interested, but he'd probably think I was a little bit crazy. Now, I said to them, and nobody disagreed. If I go to any worker in Athens, not, not worker, any taxi driver, any small businessman, and ask him, what do you want? He said, I want a revolution. And that's a fact. There was a, 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 an opinion poll last December. 63% of the people of Greece want a fundamental change in society, which I would call a revolution, and 23% want a revolution, full stop. That, according to my very poor maths, is how many? 86%. <laughs> that's not a bad, the Bolsheviks didn't have that in 1917. So what I'm saying is that the ideas which we've always stood for are gradually, the people are beginning to, only beginning, don't exaggerate, beginning to come to the same conclusions. That's our strength. And therefore, I'll finish. Comet Ted, 100 years after you, you were born, your ideas are the ones that show the way forward. And I appeal to all the comments in this room, those that are not yet members of the Socialist Appeal and the IMT, Please join us and help us in this task. Those of you that are, step up the work, comrades, to build the only organization and the only program that can guarantee the future victory of the socialist revolution of the working class of Britain, of Europe, and of the world.